Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today in this episode about the Sky130 ROM compiler, uh, we're not going to talk exactly about the design of the compiler of the or the ROM itself, but rather I'd like to present a little bit about what I've taped out on Tiny Tapeout 09 and the kind of uh, testing and characterization that this will allow me to do. So I thought I'd make this episode a little bit less scripted and just me commenting over a uh, screen capture, basically. If you go onto the Tiny Tapeout website, you can go into the Tiny Tapeout chips and then Tiny Tapeout 09. And here you will find the list of all the projects that have been taped out. If you look for ROM, you will find two tests that I've taped out. Uh, they're basically the same. There's just one where I changed the type of transistor that I used in the bit array. I used for one the uh, low voltage threshold type and for the other one the, the normal ones. I just want to compare performance and uh, leakage current basically. These are not the only two projects using a ROM built by my compiler though. There is also the Atari 2600 by Rinaldas. This project also uses a, a ROM that I built to store cartridges, basically, ROM cartridges for the Atari 2600 that he built on Tiny Tapeout 09, so that even if you don't upload any ROM on external memory, you can still run the Atari 2600, and so there is four built-in ROMs um, using that compiler, and, and we can look at that uh, quickly. If you want to download for yourself and just inspect for yourself, you can go here into the GitHub repository, and then here in release, you can find the Oasis file and download it, and then you can inspect and, and load it into Kaleout. I've already downloaded it, and so I've already started Kaleout here, so we can look at that. I will first start by hiding some stuff we don't need, like we don't need to look at the fill pattern or the seal ring, and I will also hide most of the metal layer, or actually most of the layer, and I'll just for now, I'll just actually show poly, the, the polysilicon. So I know where my ROM macros are, they're in the bottom. Um, and this is actually here, this whole big block, which I can possibly select here. Like this, this whole block is um, the Atari 2600 by Rinaldas. And so you can see here the four ROM macros. There is three here and then um, one here. And you can recognize them because of their very, very regular structure. Like you can see all the um, vertical ward lines and, and things like that. They're very easy to spot. And each of them is uh, 32 kilobits in size. So that is four kilobytes, right? Yes, they're each uh, four kilobytes. And they, they're all eight bits output. And these are the two uh, blocks that I built for testing. Um, you can see here, this macro is basically exactly the same as the one in the Atari 2600. It's a 32 kilobits ROM. And then I have got two smaller ROMs. Each of them is four kilobits. Um, they are all eight bits output. And here, the difference between the two four kilobits ones is the aspect ratio. So one of them has basically a higher mix ratio of bit line to output line, but has less word line. And the other one has more word lines, but less uh, bit lines to be uh, mixed down, basically. And, and this block here is a bit of digital logic uh, using just the standard cell library that allows me to send test signals, basically, to all those ROMs and, and, and interact with those ROMs through the marks to try to do a different kind of uh, characterization. Uh, let's look at one of the macro in more detail. Um, let me find it in the hierarchy. I think the TNT ROM test. Okay, so let me just, okay, so I have just here this macro. And we can actually look at it, just the 32K macro, for instance. Okay. So this is the 32K macro only. I'm only showing poly here, just so you can see what, what's existing. But um, what's interesting, is to look at the hierarchy because these macro are not currently entirely automatically generated. That's that's why the ROM compiler is not published yet. There is still some sizing and stuff that I need to do, uh, and some of the the um, routing is still done manually. Uh, but if I only the core here, the um, you can see the inside the ROM 32K macro, there is a core macro, 
and that part is automatically generated. So let me actually just show just that and show all the layers. Uh, show all. So all of that part is automatically generated, and that includes the bit array programmed with the content. That also includes the muxing down of the bit lines. That includes the word line drivers and the address decoding for all the word lines. And that, that includes some of the drivers for the address decoding and stuff like that. But you can see that this is connected to nothing and there's a bunch of other stuff that is not connected. And that is what I need to do still manually. If we look at the complete macro and we actually hide the part that is automatically generated, okay, this is the stuff that is still done manually. And you can see that here in the bottom, there is really not much. The only thing you find is basically some power rails. Um, these are not actually even needed. That's just gilding the lilies. But so you've got like a, some Met3 power rails that will connect upstream. Then there is a bunch of just metal one connections between the, um, if I show it again here, like these blocks, which are like the drivers for the address decoders. Uh, and the actual address decoders, the connections are not done automatically because some needs to be straight, some needs to, you know, bend at 90 degrees and stuff like that. So I haven't actually implemented that. It's nothing much, but I still need to do it. Uh, and the other part that is not generated automatically, so here is, um, again, some power routing, like all of this, which is like MET3, all of these are, are metal 3 and these are power routing. And the... Um, final output driver. So the, the final output driver is actually designed and this is the one that will be there, but it's currently not integrated automatically. So that, that still needs to be done automatically. So if you're wondering why it's not all published yet, it's because it's not entirely finished yet. Um, some of the things still actually need sizing and, and for me to be confident that my sizing is correct, I want to have some of the test chips back and that won't happen for some time. Um, okay, so now that we've looked exactly at what is being taped out uh, in Calais out, uh, we can have a quick look as to what the digital block is doing. Because if you look, so this is my macro. It's it's oriented differently from what we've seen um, in the um, in the previous screen because this just show my tiny tape out tile, but this is the 32k ROM. This is the two 4k ROMs. Then there is a bunch, like everything that you see here, like this and this, this is just routing of address and data signals. And this is the digital block that basically allows me to test the macros. Let's have a look at what that digital block does and how I intend to characterize those macros. So I drew a quick diagram here. This is basically what the digital block does. So it's really simple. It's basically three registers, or I mean, obviously each register is, is several bits wide, but uh, it's three sets of registers. A max, that's pretty much it. The two input registers allow me to easily set up a sequence of address to send to the ROM. So I can preload one address on one register, preload the other address in the register, and then I can send a clock pulse here on these registers to control precisely the value before and the value after. So to change from one address to the other, and then possibly again to the other if I also use this signal. To, so it allows me to send a, a sequence of address pretty precisely, I mean, in time, I mean. And I can, through this register, capture the result. And all of these clock lines are independent. They're, they're not related, they're different input pins, and they will be coming from an FPGA. And through the FPGA, I can basically shift them, like face shift them one compared to the other. So I can trigger an address change and then capture, you know, one nanosecond later, then 1.5 nanoseconds later, and then two nanoseconds later. And basically scan, repeat the same test, but progressively shifting the moment where I put the address and the moment where I capture the data. And I can see, you know, okay, after how, how much time how much time did the ROM need to go from the previous data to the next data and um, capture both the whole time and the setup time like this, basically, you know, what's the minimum time it took for the one data to change and when was it completely done changing? Now, of course, the tiny tape out mux and other values fluctuation uh, means that the actual 
time shift that I apply between the two registers will not be the time that the ROM took, right? Because um, the tiny tape out MUX has some variable delay depending on, on which input you're using. It's not much, but it, it can affect the results. That's why here I have a pass-through. Uh, this pass-through will basically allow me to hopefully calibrate a lot um, of the variation, both pin to pin and uh, and also for the various data pins and stuff like that so that I can calibrate out some of the MUX delays. There is also a pass-through for some of the bits that goes basically next to the ROM. So like, like this like kind of dashed line that I've drawn here, it's one of the bit of address that directly bypasses the ROM and then goes to the MUX to be captured. So I'm actually capturing more than eight bits. I'm actually capturing 10 bits here. And two of those bits are, are sort of uh, bypass bits. If, if we look in the layout itself, if we look at the big, yeah, here for instance, all the address come to here. They're the metal three lines. So here you've got the, all of these address lines. They go to all the ROM. And you can see that they go... They come from the digital blog and they go and they go to the address inputs of the ROM. But a couple of them actually don't go to the ROM at all. Instead, they just go down and just look back and they go to those pink lines that you see here. And those pink lines, two of them will be just basically looping back directly from address bits and all the other, they come from the outputs of the ROM. And it's to try and um, calibrate out routing delays so that I can try and measure only the delay of the of the ROM itself, basically. So all of these kind of, of tricks are to try to be able to measure exactly what the ROM itself is doing independently of the various routing delays that I have here, of the various routing delays that exist in the tiny tape out MUX, and even of some of the delays that I have in my digital block here. I hope it will work. We'll see uh, when I get the chip back, but um, that will probably only be middle of 2025, so it's going to be a while. Some other interesting aspects of, of how I designed this test, I, at least I think it's interesting, is this digital block. If I hide a bunch of the thing, and let's just look at poly maybe and, and, and li or something, actually just poly is fine. Um, but you can see they are, it's made out of standard cell, but it's very ordered. Like I didn't just write some very log and then let it compile a digital block. I, I wanted things to be as neat as possible, uh, mostly so that things are as matched as possible. If you look at the metal one drawing, um, for instance, uh, all the connections, you know, they're, they're all really neat. You can see it's very ordered. Uh, there is actually very little uh, metal two except for Basically, all the com connection coming in and all the com connection coming um, out um, for the address and stuff like that. Um, everything is clean and neat to try and, well, being as matched as possible. Now, obviously, drawing this by hand would have been <laughs> an absolute major pain. I I've done it for a, a previous project and that, that was really a pain. And this one has more connections. Um, so what I ended up doing is this. Let me, if I go to the tiny tape out website and you can find the ROM project and this will lead you to the Git repository of the project and that includes Pi. So I do have, I do have, um, I will say here is the very log description of the block. I've, I've written it. I've actually manually instantiated every cell here. Um, so that I could control the names and stuff like that. Um, but this description has not been used at all for synthesis. The only reason I've written it here is for LVS, is to check afterwards that what I drew uh, um, actually matched what I intended to draw. But that block is in fact done by Gen Control, And Gen Control is basically... I'm hoping to refine this in the future, but it's been useful here. Um, and the way that works is you've got some, yeah, some, some, a bunch of code here. Now let me actually zoom a little bit, maybe. Um, I don't know if I can. The goal was to have an, an API that 
fairly easy uh, to do manual layout. And so here I have the block that places the various cells. And so I define a grid of 128 by 16 row. I add a bunch of tap on this column. I, I also add tabs on other columns. I had, you know, a clock buff eight at this position. I had 10 MUX4 and the FXTP registers at those positions, you know, 10 of them programmatically. And that all of these are grid positions. So that's that makes it fairly easy to place the components without too much trouble. Uh, and then here, fill and decap is just, you know, every other side that wasn't filled with the cells that are manually placed, fill them with decap and, and, and fill cells, basically. This generates the power rails, basically bring them into MET4. Uh, if we look here, I think, if we look at metal 4, so it basically generated those rails. Let me actually just, just look at the control block. So yeah, if I had metal one, it generated those those rails here, those four rails. Um, you know, false and true says if it's for power or, or ground, basically. So, and then finally, the important part is the routing. This is done using, I think, an API that's not too annoying. You do still have to. You're not routing from from the cells themselves. You just still have to specify some coordinates, but you just specify them using um, the the column, so the x position, basically the row, and then inside the row, which track uh, because you know in standard cells you have tracks inside the, each row, and so you specify the 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 cell position and then inside the cell position, which track you want to connect to. And then you say, okay, I'm starting here in the layer LI. I want to go to MET1. I want to go to MET2. I want to move to this position. And then you can do this either in absolute or relative coordinates. Uh, and then I end the routing and then you can create a pad and then you can start another path. And so it creates all those routes um, you know, here I have a relative move, so I'm just moving from some cells or some tracks, um, and all the routing is done like this programmatically. And what this, the output of this script is actually um, a TKL script to be executed by Magic. So I, I run this, I get a TKL script, I load it in Magic, and that basically created my digital block here. This is really a rough. Thing. I definitely want to refine it and, and be um, better and cleaner. There's definitely some rough edges on, on this. Ideally, it wouldn't use magic at all. It would just use the OpenDB API or something like that. But um, this is this is the beginning of something that I think can, can be useful for manually doing these kind of digital control blocks where you want to fairly tightly control the routing and placement and all that stuff. Okay, um, I think that's pretty much it. That's all I wanted to say about this test. I, I hope that it will show that the ROM works and achieves all the performance, but mostly what I'm expecting out of it is being able to correlate um, the actual measurements with the simulation results and especially the modeling results, uh, something we're going to discuss in the next episode is uh, you know, you don't necessarily want to do a full post layout simulation of your ROM. You want to be able to model it accurately enough so that you can estimate the delay without having to run a full post layout simulation. Because if you're trying to simulate a post layout simulation of, of a you know big ROM, it takes freaking forever. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you for joining me on this journey and. You know, if you have any questions, leave it in the comments. If you thought this was interesting, um, you know, leave a like or subscribe to see the rest. And I will see you in the next one.